Hi everyone, this is Tim Melvin of the Tim Melvin Deep Value Report coming to you from down here in a central Florida on a very nice hot sunny day down here. I uh, didn't get a video out over the weekend. We had some other things we were working on and just didn't get around to it. Mostly we were sitting around reading and watching baseball, so I'll have to apologize for that. But anyway, as we come to you, the market's down about 3%. Uh, week over week. Investors got a little spooked by the 4% GDP increase uh, that was reported. And of course, there were some signs of a little bit of wage growth. And everybody kind of woke up and said, hey, if this economy gets better, the Fed may actually raise interest rates sometime next year. They panicked. We got a little bit of selling. The geopolitical situation is still... Um, not pleasant, dire would be a better phrase, with the intense fighting in the Middle East and the situation in the Ukraine's not really going away at this point in time. All that combined, the market had uh, its first down month in six months, and we had a healthy almost 3% uh, down week in the stock market last week. Now, as I look at all this, when I looked at the GDP report, I went through it, there were some signs of some pretty solid economic growth, but I saw a lot of inventory accumulation as well and of course I'm not an economist but I talked to some folks who are, are a little bit smarter about this stuff than I am and um, that could actually end up being a drag on the third and fourth quarter if those inventories are not worked off we're gonna need to see consumers and businesses do some pretty serious spending we'll see how all that plays out now you continue to watch the housing market because that's where everybody thinks all the economic growth is gonna come from and folks it's just not pretty out there in the housing market um, Forbes has an article out this week, and they kind of looked at where we are since the housing peak back in 2006. The average sales price of a home uh, reached a low of 29% below the peak. It's come back quite a bit, of course. We're about 7.5% currently below peak prices. But when we start to look at what's being sold out there, we are 75% below peak pricing that was reached in 2006 in the housing market. There's a long way to go on the upside for housing. However, you know, the foreclosure is not as talked about as much as it was because it has gotten better. We're no longer seeing millions and millions and millions of foreclosures. The foreclosure rate's still running 186% above 2006 levels. So we're still seeing an awful lot of foreclosures out there. There's still quite a bit of property in distress. The key to the housing market is, is there's still a lot of all cash or investment buyers and first time buyers are almost nowhere to be found. They're down to around 25% of all buyers, down from a number that's usually between 40 and 45%. Uh, until we get solid job creation of higher paying jobs that creates um, the desire and the ability to buy a home among these first time buyers. I don't think we see a sustained boom in housing. Now ordinarily when a sector is doing this poorly there might be some opportunity but that's not the case in the housing stocks unfortunately right now. Uh, housing hasn't been cheap oh, really since the 2011 start of 2012 period. There are in fact no US home builders trading um, below book value at this moment in time. Now we've found some opportunities in multifamily and student housing REITs, uh, the smaller ones that are still trading at nice discounts to book value, but in the builders themselves there's absolutely nothing to do from a value perspective. That could change going forward um, as people start to realize and Wall Street wakes up to the fact that hey we've been too aggressively optimistic in our assumptions about what's going to happen in the housing market. Now again I don't predict, uh, I, I, I react, so we'll sit here and wait and see if that happens, but don't be running out to buy the builders here. I think their earnings are going to be very disappointing over the second half of the year, and you're paying too high a price for what is a mediocre business right now. I hope they absolutely collapse on earnings shortfalls because, as you can see, home sales are 75% below the peak. There's a lot of ground to recover, and eventually we will. It's just not going to happen, I don't believe, in the short term. Now, having some talks with talk with some folks uh, over the weekend about an article I wrote last week uh, that appeared on Investor Place about the mining stocks. And the general question is, geez, that ter sector's terrible. How can you be buying there? Well, because it's terrible is exactly why I'm buying there. As John Templeton said, you don't look for the areas, regions, or industries that are doing well and rush to invest there. You look for the regions, industries, and sectors that are doing horribly and look for the opportunities in those sectors. Now, when I approach a company, I've got two questions on my mind when I'm analyzing a company. One, 
And most importantly, is it safe? And I measure safe as can this company survive? Do they have enough money in the bank to pay the bills? Is there too much money going out to pay interest on an enormous debt load? I want to look at this company and say, hey, they're, even if they're losing money, they're not losing a lot. Their asset value is staying relatively stable. They have a nice collection of assets. They have enough cash to pay the bills, keep the doors open, keep the lights on. Can they survive until conditions improve for the company uh, or the particular sector in the case of the mining stocks? And then the second question, of course, is it cheap? How much of a discount am I getting from the value of the assets in this company? Could it, in theory, be liquidated at a profit? If I get an answer, a yes answer to both of those questions, probably a buyer of the stock. Now, I usually like to buy things around 80% of tangible book value. That way I've got, you know, nice upside when things do recover. I'm not a macro guy. I don't know when conditions in oh, the shipping market or the, uh, uh, the mining market, metals, gold, silver, I have no idea when they're going to improve. It could be today. It could be tomorrow. It could be five years from now. I, I, not a macro guy, not real good on the economic side of things, so I don't know. But it is a reasonable assumption to assume that at some point over the next five or even ten years, we're going to work off some of this excess capacity in the mining industry. Um, the economy will pick up and create demand. Uh, gold and silver demand will return. There'll be an economic or geopolitical event uh, that spurs uh, gold buying, uh, which will, of course, lift silver right along high with it. And these mining stocks will go higher, and they'll trade for several multiples of the current price. My holding period is basically until it works. Um, and I said, I don't know if that's six months or six years, but as long as I get a reasonable rate of return on my money, 15, 20% compounded, and these things go up to several multiples of book value, as opposed to today's discount to book value that I'm buying at, I'm a pretty happy camper. The key is patience and discipline. Now, looking at the market right now, as I said, I don't like to react. I mean, I don't like to predict. I prefer to react to what the market does. I just kind of sat down and took a look at where we are in the market. I ran some screens to see how many cheap stocks are out there and where they are. Now, out of a 7,000 stock database, we came up with 115 U.S. companies that passed just my initial uh, safe and cheap screen, and that's just a you know, couple of quick financial factors. And then as we started to work it down and we added some more uh, uh, credit checks and uh, hoops for these, uh, these companies to have to jump through, our 115 stocks came down to about 50. And then we took it down a little bit further and we went to the point where I like to buy 80% or less of tangible book value. It's only 15 companies that pass. We already own them all uh, in the portfolio. So not a lot for us to do uh, on the deep value side. We're kind of sitting on our hands right now. There's not a lot of new safe and cheap stocks being created at this moment in time. Now where the opportunity lies is if we can just get a, a rational pullback in the market. Remember, we haven't had anything in about three years now that was meaningful in nature. We have another 105 companies that meet our criteria, pass our credit checks, and trade below 80% of tangible book value. So it's not going to take a lot for us to start getting excited about buying some of these safe and cheap stocks. When we apply that to the community banks, which of course is my favorite sector in the whole wide world, um, and by the way, last week we had another tank takeover in the portfolio, kind of getting into a, uh, you know, another week, another takeover type scenario as the consolidation wave uh, continues to move on. But anyways, 24 small banks trading below tangible book value that have an equity to assets ratio greater than 10. And again, we already own them all, so there's not a ton of stuff to do in the small bank space right now. However, the opportunity is lurking. There's 74 banks that have an adequate equity to assets ratio that trade between 80% and one times tangible book value. So if we got a 10 or 15% correction in this market that starts to bring some of this stuff down, we're going to get to be pretty busy on the buy side in all of our value and bank oriented portfolios. So that oh, can't predict it. Pretty sure it's going to happen at some point in time. There will be an inventory creation event. I've been doing this for a long time. I remember a tremendous stretch in the 1990s where we had no significant inventory creation events. But if you're patient enough and you're disciplined, they do always happen and you'll get a chance to, like Hetty Green or uh, Mr. Womack the Pig Farmer, buy when everybody else is selling and sit back and reap tremendous rewards over the next several years. So let's hope it happens soon. Anyway, as we're coming here, 
here we've still got that lovely phrase, the first place Baltimore Orioles. They've just come off a tremendous road trip, taking three series on the West Coast, came back and won the first series back at home against the Seattle Mariners, so they're looking pretty good. Now tonight we've got a makeup game against the Washington Nationals. That's always an exciting time. They're sending a pitcher to the mound tonight who has a four-game win streak going. So we're sending Kevin Gossman, our rookie, who's looking pretty good himself. So we'll see how that little game goes, but then it's crunch time. The big gut check comes into town this week. We've got the second place right on our heels, Toronto Blue Jays. That's going to be a tough series. We can walk out of this with a commanding lead over the Blue Jays of about five and a half games, I think it would be, or we could be in second place if we dropped the whole series at this point in time. So we've got to check it up, get our bats going again, because we want a lot of low-scoring games on that road trip. Um, we need to start putting some runs on the board and blow the Blue Jays away. And I also find myself rooting for the Detroit Tigers this week because they've got the New York Yankees, and I would love to see the Tigers just push the Yankees further back um, in the standings so that we don't have a threat of a New York uh, September surge. So, Anyway, that's the week in baseball for us. We've got the Cardinals, by the way. That's going to be an interesting thing after the Blue Jays leave town. Hopefully we're you know five games or more up at that point in the standings. Uh, Cardinals are a tough team, and we don't usually play them even in interleague. So I'm kind of looking excited to to uh, that series over the weekend on the book front we got a new web griffin book coming out it's a whole new series with new characters love reading these guys books they're just always a great read good stories very great in, in, uh, recreational reading i guess we'll call it uh, i've read every book he's ever written and i'm a big fan of his so i'm looking forward to that one uh, there's a study released on amazon it's a uh, 10 bucks that i think yeah you would find interesting. It's called Quantitative Investing in Europe, and they look at what has and has not worked in European stocks since 1911. You'll be shocked to find, of course, that price to book value is the best metric, but he does. the authors do some combinations of metrics, uh, and there's some pretty interesting information. So anyway, that's Quantitative Investing in Europe. It's uh, 10 bucks on Amazon. just came out last week. It's another book. I'm a news and political junkie. I can't pass on this one. Uh, there's a book coming out called The Invisible Bridge from the Fall of Nixon to the Rise of Reagan, where the author looks at uh, the transition of the Republican Party in the 1970s into the uh, 1980s. That should be kind of an interesting read, actually. All right. Uh, news light this week. We don't have a lot going on. We've got the ISM uh, non-manufacturing numbers. We've got a Bank of Japan policy statement. Just not a lot going on on the economic front. Lots of earnings coming out. Of course, down here in Orlando, everybody's waiting for the big Disney earnings tomorrow uh, based on the traffic I've seen in the parks and the fact that they've um, still riding on some pretty strong movie results. I think they're going to do uh, have a fantastic report. The stock will probably go higher. Um, I don't own it anymore. We bought it back in 2000. 2009, sold it when it crossed above 40, um, but I'm, I'm sure they'll have a good report, and we've got all the other TV networks and cable companies and satellite companies coming out this week, too, um, and just based on the fact that America is a nation of couch potatoes, I'm sure all of them did pretty good, so got a lot going on on the earnings front. Not much on the economics front, so hopefully it'll be a quiet week. I don't think any Fed officials are being let out unescorted to give various speeches that will move the market this week. So maybe we get a nice, quiet first trading week of August. Anyway, this is Tim Melvin with the Tim Melvin Deep Value Report down here in sunny central Florida, and we'll talk to you next week.